Namaste dear students. In this lecture, we'll try to understand transnational economic actors and their role in transnational governance. For this, we have to first of all understand what is transnational governance and what do we really mean by transnational economic actors. First, we'll try to understand these two and then we'll move on to the debates of how these uh, transnational economic actors work in transnational governance. There are three debates that we will primarily focus. So to begin with transnational governance, we in today's world always listen to this, this uh, uh, statement that world is one community. At the time of pandemic we have seen, at the time of global terror, whenever there is any terrorist strike we come to know that yes the globe is one community. But what does it actually mean? The other side of the story is if uh, one part is affected, the entire globe is affected too. That is, a domino effect is there in the globe. So now if you try to understand this particular statement or understanding in the economic perspective of the uh, global integrated economy or what we call as uh, global market, then also we, we realize that if there is uh, one crackdown in, in one particular uh, economy of, uh, of this globe, then other states' economy, that too gets affected. Say for example, if there is a crash in US share market, then it also affects all the other countries. Also there are some debates that uh, India is not that much affected at the time of global recession and all these things, but generally the idea is uh, if the world is integrated economy, then all the other parts or all the other uh, states, they get affected too. So here we'll take a pause. Now we'll move on to uh, one, one other aspect that we, we really realize that issues like environmental degradation or global terror or even pandemic or even security, nuclear threats. These cannot be tackled by one individual state. Why? Particularly because one national or international border cannot really protect uh, or, or isolation of a particular society or a state cannot really protect that particular uh, nation state. So there, there is a need of global integration. And when there is a global integration, now we'll fo move on to the economic sector. And when there is a integration in, in global economy, so states are not the uh, autonomous sole actors as the realists argued. Now, if states are the players of that particular global economy or that particular market along with some major non-state actors, who will govern it? So the question is governing the entire world without governments. So what to do? The answer is there are some institutions that were built primarily after the global recession of 1930s and people realized, global leaders realized, major multinational corporations realized that isola isolation of a particular economy does not solve the problem. We have to get integrated. And when we integrate, it is not the nation state that can work autonomously, that, that can uh, go according to their whims and fancy. What they have to do? They have to work together under at least one agreement. Or there should be some issues of governance. There should be one uh, institutions that will look after whether these treaties are maintained or not. It is not about authority in that sense, how we understand in any uh, dictatorship or in any autocratic country, but we have to abide by, or any nation state has to abide by their agreement. So the terms of trade now is under the scanner of some institutions, and these entire management started to be known as global governance, at least in economic sectors. In other sectors like environment or nuclear regime, we find that there are some institutions like IAEA, and in case of environment, there are Paris, Peace, uh, Paris Treaty, there are Rio de Janeiro Conference, but all these try to uh, bring all the states together to work together for a better world. Now let's understand 
what is or what do we mean by transnational economic actors now transnational economic actors are those economic bodies or or corporations that are not restricted within one particular nation state now what do we mean by it primarily we had an idea when uh, societies were primitive that the the market will be taken care by the state and that was primarily a role of a liberal state but when liberals uh, if in 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 18th century or in 19th century they realized that the global poverty cannot be tackled by one particular isolationist state it is a global problem so it demands a global solution so what is to be done these economies are to be integrated and if my profit can be shared with others then their problems can be solved too so development the idea of development uh, they argued that if you are isolationist as the leftists argued that uh, integration with the global economy is rather a problem than a solution and they advised that import substitutive industrialization is the solution of all problems now liberals argued that no you have to get integrated with the global economy and uh, how about catering a market of say uh, only 10 million people or 3 billion people look at the uh, smaller countries so if you want to profit more you have to reach the global market and that was the understanding of uh, major uh, corporations that later became multinational corporations now in this particular transnational economic actors we find two types of organizations that are uh, that cannot be controlled or or not uh, confined within a particular national boundary these are uh number 1 multinational corporations and number 2 uh intergovernmental organizations so let us first of all understand what is multinational corporations say for example we all know that uh, apple is a multinational corporations or or coca cola is a multinational corporation what do we mean by it apple they have a funding uh, from us or their investors are from us their manufacturing in 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 china they are selling in uh, all the countries of the world and their their uh, laborers are from say from india from us from uh, scandinavian countries or even from bangladesh their packet is uh, being prepared in say uh, bangladesh so these factors of production that we know as land labor capital and market these are distributed or or distributed in different parts of the world that is why these are called multinational corporations and it's it's really surprising to note that the largest 500 corporations control more than 2/3 of global trade much of which occurs between their subsidiary firms so this argument of of liberals that trickle down effect of a big corporations does not really uh, uh, benefit all these countries because their trade is mostly confined within their own uh, own bodies or within their own organizations and it's surprising to note that the largest 100 corporations are estimated to account for nearly 1/3 of global foreign direct investment MNCs are without a doubt the most controversial of all transnational actors not just transnational economic actors MNCs are largely criticized because it is often argued that they make profit at the cost of the poverty of the third world or or the developing nations why so because they destroy the the uh, the economy of that particular country and when a uh, uh, economy or particular uh, 
uh, of a particular developing nation does not stand or that get destroyed what happens it primarily or at the uh, i mean it primarily targets the stability of that particular country and that is why we have seen that the mass poverty in different developing countries is it leads to a political crisis in these countries which finally creates a kind of instability and that may lead towards a political decay next what is very important in our understanding of this particular topic is intergovernmental organizations particularly we will focus on the economic uh, organization now these economic organizations were primarily set up with the idea of an integrated global economy and that in 1940s uh, 50s uh, at the time of bretton wood conference or as a consequence of bretton wood conference so we have in today's world very important organizations like wto world bank imf etc etc later established but it is uh, equally important uh, like opec and along with this we also have uh, uh, asia asean also has some uh, this kind of things eec economic uh, european economic cooperation safta etc now to focus or to begin with uh, wto what does it do it it actually works towards promotion of free trade and resolving trade disputes among the countries imf works towards monetary cooperation and international trade promotion of international trade and recovery from financial crisis of many countries we have seen earlier in 1991 india after uh, 40 years of independence went into a scenario where uh, it was uh, i mean india had to deposit its foreign gold its gold reserve in a in a foreign bank so then we took loan from imf today we see pakistan into into a crisis uh, when imf is giving loans so imf was was uh, established with this goal of uh, recovering financial crisis transnational economic actors were always a brain child or or uh, these were advocated by the pluralist uh, arguments or or the advocates of liberal international relations theorists they argued number one that states are not the autonomous or sole important actor in international politics and number two if uh, security is given most uh, uh, prime focus in the study of international relations it cannot lead towards peace so primarily to curb down or to ensure uh, peace in in global uh space we have to promote business integrated economy and it's not like uh, it's absolutely wrong or something there is nothing absolutely right or absolutely wrong there are some instances in uh in europe where these arguments actually worked if you if you look at the second world war second world war is basically the civil war of europe or even the first world war so the point is liberals always argue that number one is is uh, transnational actors are very important and number two that in order to ensure peace we have to uh, promote business integrated economy trade and commerce now what is the argument of of the leftist they argue that these consideration of of the of the liberals that in order to ensure peace we have to promote business is fine but it's it's not right uh, it, it may be a noble or good idea but it is uh, it is not really the uh, the case so what do they argue they argue that uh, how these mncs or 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 this particular uh, intergovernmental organizations work they rather work towards the Uh, degradation or or further uh, instead of poverty elevation they work towards poverty creation in these uh, countries how do they analyze the theorists like 
Emmanuel Wallerstein in, in his wall systems theory or Andre Gunder Frank in his dependency theory, they talk about these MNCs are like satellites. They extract uh, the resources from these, from these uh, peripheral societies and send it to the core of the world. Uh, and what happens? What is the consequence? As a consequence, these countries, which are periphery according to their version, somehow get neglected and they can never become uh, rich or prosperous. So this entire uh, mechanism is nothing but a, a design towards keeping them poor forever. Next, the left-leaning global justice theorist Thomas Pogge also argued that these uh, intergovernmental organizations like IMF, World Bank, WTO, these are also the reason for global poverty. They set such terms of trade in, in the name of uh, global trade that some countries always get advantage and some countries never get advantage. They are always in a disadvantageous position. And since they are dependent on, on this uh, mechanism, they cannot go out of it. Next is the debate between liberals and realists. I have already uh, stated that what is the argument of the liberals. They said that uh, this is how we can ensure peace and there will be no further war. Realists, on the other hand, they argue that this particular uh, argument that, uh, that uh, economy is somehow bind these two societies together and not just these uh, governmental elites or, or government to government relations are important. The, the business relations or the trade relations are equally or more important. Realists do not buy this argument. They argue that this is finally the security terms that matters and rest will follow. See, uh, India and US, we largely disagree on many issues of, of, uh, of trade or bilateral trade or even global trade. But we consider uh, USA as an ally. For a long time, we did not term US an ally, but even but today, we consider them an uh, important strategic partner and call them ally without any hesitation. It's important to remember that uh, Donald Trump, the, he is rather a soft person towards India. He even called India uh, the tariff king. It was a very harsh criticism, but we somehow ignored that aspect. So the preponderance, the logic of preponderance of, of, uh, of economic relations that liberals argued is not really uh, accepted by the realist. They say that no, uh, military relations is most important and state to state relations is most important. Trade relations will, will fall in line and transnational actors are important only if, for, if it follows the line of the state. So state is, again and again they argue that state is the most important actor in, in everywhere in global governance, in transnational governance, everywhere state is most important. Now, clubbing this all, all uh, criticism against the, the, the liberals or, or transnational economic actors, there is a new uh, trend in, in, in criticizing the, the, the transnational economic actors that we find in the debate of global north and global south. And this is the harshest criticism against any transnational economic actors that they serve the interest of the global rich or the global north. These IMF, WTO, World Bank in particular, these organizations are nothing but umbrella organizations of these rich European countries and United States of America. And in this criticism, India collaborates with China 
with Pakistan, with Sri Lanka, that these policies of IMF, WTO, these are hopelessly against these global south or, or, or the countries from global south. Now we can remember the, the scenario of the debate between India and WTO. WTO categorically and relentlessly have argued that India must not subsidize its own domestic agrarian population. And their argument is if you subsidize these farmers, then the cost of their production should not be matched or cannot be matched in global uh, platform. So their cost of production is becoming low so that they can gain more advantage in the name of in, 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 uh, in terms of profit in, in global agrarian trade. But the reality is even the countries like uh, US or, or the European countries, they also subsidize their agrarian uh, population and they, they subsidize more than India. The point is they have uh, standardized the rate at the time of 1986 that we are not really very comfortable with. At the 1986 scenario is not really uh, very comfortable for us. We want it to be revised. And we in India have these, uh, these policy of MSP, that is minimum support price to the farmers. Now, if we do not ensure at the time of boom in, in, in harvesting, if we do not ensure that this minimum price will be, will be provided, if, if there is a huge production to the farmers and, and their, their uh, production will be taken or, or will be bought by the government. So if this cannot be ensured, the, the, the country of India cannot survive because it's, it has a huge agrarian population. And of course, the government has some welfare, uh, the role, uh, role in welfare. So who will ensure uh, th uh, this kind of MSP if the government doesn't do it? And when India bought, or the government of India bought uh, the, the rice and wheat uh, with this MSP, WTO uh, did not allow India to sell it at the time of global food crisis right after the Ukraine-Russia war. And there was a case against India by Brazil and, and Australia that India must not sell this in global market. And even they allowed the food crisis to, to take place, but they did not allow India to, to, to sell this uh, and in, order to, in order to combat global food crisis. So the situation is we can have multiple other scenarios like we, we see these days IMF is giving, uh, has finally given loan but with some recommendations to Pakistan. We can witness that the situation in many countries is like we have to, the, the global south countries, we have to fit into the conditions of these institutions like IMF, WTO and, and IMF now if you look into it has huge investment and where do they get the money from? They get the money from US largely. So they serve the interest of the uh, US, the state of uh, US and their uh, other actors in their country. Had it been uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that is uh, that has headquarters in Beijing, of course they would have uh, listen to this, uh, the, the China. So finally we, under, we understand that uh, the, the global north has a preponderance in, in, in these uh, transnational economic actors and their uh, transnational governance. So finally we can conclude that uh, we should not take any uh, strong position or extreme position that this is good, this is bad. Liberals have, of course have some merit, although realists also have some merit, so is the global south.